introducing myself a little bit and, and obviously dating myself a little bit as well. Um, but um, uh, then my background has has always been microbial genomics. So so this um, workshop is really uh, near and dear to my heart because it's, it's what I enjoy doing and what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so. Um, so initially I started doing microbial genomic analysis and then did some metagenomic analysis as a postdoc. And after that, I uh, joined EC Center for Disease Control as the lead bioinformatician there and um, essentially uh, worked on building genomic epidemiology capacities in our public health sector uh, for about eight years. And in 2020, right during the pandemic, I moved to SFU full-time as an um, associate professor there and focused more on uh, research rather than a mixture of research and service, but still very much um, interested and, and still very much involved in, in public health collaborations, especially in working with public health to uh, improve data sharing and also to improve uh, collaborative data analysis and so on. And some of that uh, messaging will come across in our series of uh, lectures in this workshop. So that's a bit of introduction of myself, and I will begin um, the introductory lecture uh, of this workshop. The purpose of the introductory lecture really is to provide a bit of a, a common background and a bit of a level playing field for everyone in the workshop. So some of you may found may find the material uh, quite redundant when you've heard about it already, or maybe you're even more of an expert than me in some of the material covered. And if, if that's the case, uh, do feel free to contribute in Slack and adding to the material about your own uh, experience or your own uh, knowledge. I think we very much welcome you know, sharing of knowledge is for those of you who might have less background in the area, hopefully the lecture is accessible, but if it's not, again, please do feel free to post any clarification questions on Slack and the TAs and uh, other instructors and myself will uh, attempt to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so as I mentioned already, I'm at the at Simon Fraser University and I run a group called Center for Infectious Disease Genomic and One Health. Um, Nia already talked about the course overview, but I thought I would post the course overview from 2017. This is not in your slide deck, but I just added it sort of as a contrast to the material that we're uh, doing today. Um, and in 2017, uh, this, of course, was pre-pandemic, was when this workshop was first offered. And you can see that a lot of the material is still very much in common. Um, but you can also see that we really only focus on bacterial genomic analysis and not much on viruses. And this is, as you'll see later, that uh, because pre-pandemics, the most active area of genomic epidemiology was focused on foodborne bacterial pathogen research. So a lot of our collective experience and also our uh, examples were drawn from that uh, area. So we sort of talked about the um, uh, phylogenetic analysis, molecular subtyping of bacterial virus, uh, sorry, bacterial genomes. And then we, of course, still have a, a uh, antimicrobial resistance section, uh, but uh, what has changed, we changed out a little bit, we'll actually add to is the phylogeographic section. Now it's sort of rebranded more as a, a phylodynamics and, and more with a, um, a, a viral and, and more integrated approach to add non-sequence uh, and non- um, uh, my uh, num, um, uh, evolutionary or phylogenetic data to the analysis. And then we also uh, incorporate data visualization more as a, a 
overarching theme through the uh, mod, uh, throughout all the modules rather than its own section. So this is, uh, as uh, Nia already presented, the um, updated module with a lot more focuses on viruses and also um, uh, adding uh, environmental microbiology aspect to the, uh, uh, to the workshop. And we expanded the number of modules and it's a three days, now it's a, a four day virtual workshop. Okay. Well, I should also know that Samira Baraka from uh, Sunnybrook will be our keynote uh, speaker. And I was late in asking her for a title, that's why it hasn't been decided, but she'll be talking about um, her experience during the pandemic. And Samira is actually once a, a workshop participant as well. Uh, so it's just nice to have her coming back to give this keynote. Oh, sorry, I forgot to close my slides. Okay, so the um, general learning objectives for the whole workshop is to understand how genomic epidemiology can improve clinical and public health microbiology, and also to process genomic sequence data using various bioinformatic tools for bacterial and viral genomes and metagenomes as well. Also to interpret genomic data in epidemiological context and to understand and uh, the importance of data standardization and sharing. And actually that's another module that we, instead of embedding in, in um, just in passing, we pulled it out and made it its own module this time around to highlight the importance of that. And we also performed several uh, types of genomic epidemiology analysis as part of your lab sessions. And you will uh, hopefully throughout the workshop, throughout the interaction, recognize the limitations and challenges associated with genomic epidemiology analysis. As this is very much still an evolving field with new methods and new techniques being developed. Specifically, the learning objective for this module is to understand why infectious disease research is important and be familiar with some examples of genomic epidemiology studies. I think the importance of infectious disease research probably uh, doesn't need to be highlighted after the collective, collective experience we've been through, but it may also not be surprising that we are, as a, as a society, quite forgetful and often post-pandemic, a lot of the good intentions get drawn out by other priorities. So something to keep in mind that we should leverage the collective efforts have been put into uh, fight this pandemics and then make sure the lesson learned are not um, forgotten or uh, the efforts are um, um, uh, ignored. And so we also uh, will be from, uh, familiar with uh, some sequence data processing. I'll give a very, very, very high level overview of how we process genomic sequence data. So you know the data that you're receiving, how they were generated, and then to understand the challenges associated with um, sharing genomic epidemiology data, which would actually uh, be uh, further expanded upon in module three. MS section. So I want to start with uh, some examples of uh, genomic epidemiology studies. So as we all we know, we all live in an increasing interconnected world with, uh, well, in this case, so many of you from different time zones, different areas around the world. The picture here shows the flight path um, of commercial air travel. And um, we know that pathogen often Travels with uh, with the with its human or animal or, or other host and can quickly transport um, through out the world. It's also uh, interesting to show these uh, two uh, figures side by side. They're just a month apart, showing the uh, this is the uh, satellite picture of the airplanes in that's actually in the air. Um, and so it's not just the flight path anymore. And you could see that 
the you know after the pandemic was declared, the number of international travels and or even domestic travels uh, reduced significantly. So the um, the uh, uh, for example, travel between Europe and and North America or between Asia and Europe, you can see that they reduce significantly and, and not to mention to Australia and New Zealand as well. So um, case to point about um, pathogens can travel with, with human passengers. Here is a study uh, it's quite old from 2015, but I still like it a lot. It's a study by the a Danish group that uh, look at microbes that are found in the airplane toilets. They so they fill out filter out the the um, microbes from the human waste that are collected from 18 different flights and um, that uh, traveled across uh, three different uh, continents, and then they looked at what um, uh, what the microbiome profile looks like um, in in these samples. So they cluster the samples based on the microbiome profile, and then uh, they also look at the uh, presence of antimicrobial resistant uh, genes in these samples. Okay, so they found that this, uh, the samples indeed cluster based on geographic locations, as you can see in the the uh, the uh, tree on the on the left. You can see that the North American uh, ones are on the left, Asia in the middle, and so on. So and, and again, North American on the right. So um, so it shows that the uh, Microbiome profiles could actually be used to differentiate the origin of the the, um, the flights. Uh, moreover, they also uh, highlighted that uh, there is a higher proportion of antibiotic resistant genes found in flights uh, that originated from South uh, from South Asia. Um, so the, uh, the study highlight that AMR. Genes could spread quickly around the world through global through global travel travelers, and you'll learn more about um, AMR in uh, a AMG antimicrobial resistant ARGs or antimicrobial resistant genes uh, in uh, module six and how these can be uh, identified and characterized. Okay, uh, next, I want to highlight a study that looked at uh, emerging infectious diseases. So uh, emerging infectious disease events were defined as the detection of newly evolved strains of a pathogen. So for example, a new variant of, of um, uh, coronavirus, right, SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, but not the re-emergence of a known pathogen or known strain. Uh, in and this so that's their definition and they looked at it over the last six decades and they noticed uh, uh, that there's an increasing uh, trend over the, the decades as you can see here uh, on the graph all the on the on the graph here all the uh, uh, number of uh, emerging infectious disease events uh, increase over the, the decades. And then further, they uh, looked at different subcategories of, of um, EIDs. And they, for example, noticed that uh, the number of drug resistant versus non drug resistant uh, cases also increased over the decades. Um, similarly, uh, vector borne versus non vector borne, which is the vector borne is white, uh, also increase over the decade. And about two thirds of the emerging cases are so called zoonotic. So these are the white, uh, so the basically the non blacks, the white, orange, or red, and highlighting the um, importance of a One Health approach to understand uh, emerging infectious diseases as, as these. Uh, events seem to be dominated 
by zoonotic uh, diseases. Okay, so uh, next we'll look at, um, this is almost a decade ago now, the Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa in 2014 or 2013. Um, so it highlighted the global interventions uh, using genomic epidemiology approaches to understand the transmission and the spread of this virus. Um, the, this is the most deadly uh, Ebola outbreak in history resulted in 20, more than 28,000 um, reported cases and 11, 000, more than 11,000 deaths. It has a significant impact on global travel. And even though, and at that time I was at BCCBC, even though there wasn't any case uh, in Canada, all the public health agencies were under high alert uh, and had to conduct training and uh, preparedness uh, tasks in case that uh, a case end up landing um, uh, in Canada. And, and I, I think other countries went through similar exercises uh, as a precaution. So the Ebola uh, genomes from approximately 5% of the cases were eventually sequenced uh, in uh, from, from this outbreak. And this result in a wealth of information. So uh, this study, which highlighted uh, some uh, link down here, uh, look at the um, early samples uh, that was sequenced and, to, uh, and the analysis revealed that the outbreak uh, was believed to actually start with a single human exposure to a, a natural reservoir and not a repeat exposure during this particular outbreak. And also the outbreak was uh, then sustained by human-to-human -human transmission from uh, Guinea to Sierra Leone. And it's likely to be uh, uh, from a, a um, single event, but with two distinct uh, transmission, uh, two distinct strains transmitted uh, in parallel. So they were able to, as you can see here, uh, identify separate clusters uh, uh, Doing uh, using genomic sequence data, and and these uh, transmission were likely uh, sustained through, as I mentioned, human to human, and uh, the uh, widespread of, of the transmission was likely results of of lack of proper quarantine facilities in the early stages of the uh, the outbreak, and. The phylogenetic analysis also showed that the transmission from uh, Guinea to Sierra Leone, um, as I mentioned, is from likely from a single event. So the, the phylogenetic analysis has the ability to really tease out, uh, based on the genetic uh, diversity or genetic variations, the likely uh, transmission scenario. Uh, but although epidemiological, in other words, contextual evidence is needed to collaborate on the um, on the genetic evidence. So the phylogenetic analysis uh, combined with, with epidemiology investigations help to unravel the complex transmission dynamics and provide healthcare workers uh, the, the, the knowledge or the information to institute effective policies and interventions. And, but as I was saying, there's still unfortunately a, a huge delay at the beginning resulted in an unacceptable uh, mortality in this uh, outbreak. So fast forward to 2018, uh, there was another uh, outbreak in uh, DRC. And because it, this time around, uh, the DRCs, uh, the, the uh, practitioners are much more prepared than have experienced dealing with outbreaks. And also globally, there's a faster mobilization of resources. And I understand, of course, even though it's incrementally better than previous experience that, uh, I mean, a lot of the mobilization efforts is still challenging, but nevertheless, WHO and World Bank have set, had set up um, standing emergency fund to deal with these emergencies. And also there was stockpiling of vaccines to uh, try to stem the, uh, the the onward transmission of the 
the virus. And of course, drugs were, were developed during the first, uh, during the, the last, I should say, the uh, Ebola uh, outbreak and, and were um, made available for subsequent outbreaks, just like um, what, what we're doing with the, the vaccine development and drug development in our, um, in the COVID-19 out, uh, outbreak. So they also were able to engage globally or outside healthcare workers uh, uh, faster and be able to uh, put the health interventions in earlier. Now, so uh, the next uh, outbreak that I want to highlight is the Zika outbreak. So unlike Ebola, of course, Zika is uh, uh, Zika virus causes much milder symptom for most peoples and have been endemic in Asia and in Africa for many decades before they uh, caused an outbreak in the more uh, naive population or naive to the virus population in Americas. And because the population in Americas were naive to this virus, it caused a lot more uh, severe cases uh, in the, the newly exposed population. So the outbreak resulted in a few thousand microcephalus cases, um, uh, syphily cases, I mean, like, uh, and this is likely, again, due to the populations um, not being, uh, in, uh, having immunity to the, to the um, virus. And because the symptom of, of Zika infection overlapped with other um, flabby viruses, uh, such as dengue and uh, others, uh, surveillance efforts based on symptoms alone is not sufficient. So laboratory tests based on serology and molecular tests such as uh, genomics and others on, uh, were needed to for confirmation. Yes, Andrew. Will, we're still seeing the Ebola slide. Oh, sorry. I kept forgetting to advance in my slides. Yeah, thanks. Just forgot to advance that one. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the, pic, the, the slides actually um, just depicting some of the, the patterns that, that was uh, detected doing, uh, using genomics information. So the phylogenetic reconstruction of the case suggests that the viruses has circulated in South America for at least one year prior to it being noticed uh, as, uh, in an outbreak. As I mentioned, the symptoms are quite mild and overlap with other uh, known viruses. So the data was, uh, this data was used to reconstruct the transmission route uh, as shown in this diagram, on, on, in this picture on the right. And the um, gap in surveillance efforts uh, because the virus is, uh, is not known to the population, or at least not, not keenly aware by the population, um, affected the, the surveillance effort, right? So genomic-based uh, surveillance, on the other hand, go moving into the future will reduce such a gap and, and allow um, uh, potential uh, new viruses to be detected as well, because genomic-based approach is much more um, agnostic to uh, uh, the, the, the um, pathogens. Okay, so the uh, the next case I wanted to to highlight is related to uh, avian influenza viruses, and this is a study that, uh, in collaboration with BCCDC, with the BC Animal Health uh, Center, and uh, uh, CFIA, Canadian Flu Inspection Agency, and a few pa other partners. We conducted a study to see if we could detect avian flus from environmental samples. So, as many of you know, um, avian influenza uh, travels with their uh, bird host, and because these migratory birds uh, has a wide range and their flyways often uh, cross with each other, um, this resulted in opportunities for different strains of influenza viruses to commingle and to uh, to um, 
we assort, right? We we assort their genomes and and a new variant that could therefore arise from this mixing of of uh, virus populations. So in 2014, um, there was a, a oops, jumps ahead. There's there was a, a North American and, and actually a global outbreak um, of um, H5 and uh, two um, strain uh, that I initially come in as H H5 and one I believe and then um, and in uh, Fraser Valley of of BC a uh, large number of farms were affected, resulting in a quarter million of birds that were destroyed in the process. And uh, as the bird traveled from Alaska down the West Coast and into the United States, um, US actually was also affected by this outbreak and it uh, resulted in about $3 billion of damage in North, in the uh, United States. and about 300 million damages uh, uh, in Canada. So we were engaged to see if um, we could have a better approach to do a avian influenza surveillance um, because, uh, because the uh, bird-based testing was actually uh, quite ineff ineffective. Um, so uh, currently the, the approach for influenza surveillance is mostly passive. So it tests uh, waterfowl that were dead from other causes for um, presence of, of influenza virus. Active surveillance, such as capturing testing live birds or uh, hunters submitting kill birds, sam samples from kill birds to, to the testing labs were quite uh, seldomly done and, and Again, the positive rate, overall positivity rate is quite, quite low. Um, sorry, I guess there's a timer on this slide, so it kept working itself. Um, apologize for that. So the overall positive rate from these uh, existing surveillance is less than 1%. Um, in other words, less than one out of 100 samples tested would be positive. And as a result of that, the uh, presence of high pathogenicity avian flus that resulted in the outbreaks evaded the detection uh, process, the surveillance process. So we took a, a different approach. We essentially went into the wetlands where these birds were um, residing or, and, and then we uh, collected muds from this environment that contains the bird species, which uh, then contain these viruses. And then we, um, through rounds of amplification, uh, then attempt to detect the viral RNAs, uh, which then translate uh, or transcribe to DNA, and um, and from there we use sequencing to identify the subtype of viruses that are present, and this uh, result in a much higher positivity rate, and roughly thirty percent of our samples were tested positive. Of course, we tested high the, in the farm samples or test much more highly um, positive uh, as expected. But even in the environments, we were able to have high, fa fairly high positivity rate. And more importantly, as a tree pointed out here, the samples um, we collected actually then show um, virus strains that cluster together with the outbreak strain of the virus, uh, suggesting that our approach does uh, uh, can be used to identify the specific strain of the viruses that, that uh, cause outbreaks. Okay. And last little bit, I will last example I'll highlight is that um, to illustrate why genomic sequencing. Uh, is important. So many AMR genes are encoded in mobile genetic elements and therefore can move independently of the host uh, um, uh, core genomic material. So through the process called horizontal gene transfer rather than clonal expansion. So um, 
detecting the genes by PCR, if you just focus on a subset of, of genes, marker genes, or if you focus on uh, species identification genes alone, is insufficient to understand and characterize the uh, antimicrobial resistant profile of the, um, the organism and to understand the transmission of these uh, ARGs, these, these genes. So here's a study that showed that the AMR profile as shown in the heat map on the right um, is actually quite different from the uh, phylogenetic tree that's built based on MLST uh, patterns. So you'll learn more about MLST, core genome MLSTs uh, in Ed's lecture uh, tomorrow. So um, stay tuned for that. But what I want to point out is that the, uh, the uh, core phylogeny of the of this bacteria actually are not consistent with the uh, a uh, the antimicrobial resistant genes that they carry. So you can see some of the, the ones that are clustered together phylogenetically actually have different um, uh, ARGs. So you could see the, the patterns on these um, uh, heat maps are quite different, okay? All right, so I will now uh, just, that was some examples of, of uh, using it, uh, genomic epidemiology to, uh, in various applications. But I'll now uh, move more towards um, the process itself. So uh, the, as I mentioned, whole genome sequencing of foodborne pathogens was the name of the game uh, at the beginning of, of genomic epidemiology, partly because there's a lot of uh, global efforts to, to use geno uh, genomics sequencing to study foodborne pathogens. So for example, the UK Public Health uh, England, which is now called something else, um, have uh, star sequencing all salmonella isolates in the UK uh, since 2014. And uh, US FDA and also CDC also created a distributed network of, of labs to utilize whole genome sequencing for uh, foodborne pathogen tracking and identification. So they call this system uh, genome tracker. This result in a large number of genomes becoming available uh, publicly, and that could be uh, that could be used for analysis. So one study I want to highlight is actually one that was done by Jimmy, one of uh, my students, and also TA in in this um, workshop. And uh, he we really benefit from the availability of these genomes, and so he took all the publicly available genome and um, compare the serotypes of, of uh, salmonella to the phylogenetic tree that were constructed uh, using genomic sequences. And again, you'll learn how to do that uh, later in this workshop. So on the, uh, um, this uh, minimum spanning tree or the clustering tree on the, uh, um, well, actually, this is a neighbor joining tree, but it's, it's shown as a, a, a clustering pattern. Um, essentially, what, what I want to highlight is that um, the trees are labeled with uh, serotypes, but the tree, uh, the clustering patterns were determined on um, phylogenetic distance. And you can see that. In most cases, this, they do correspond to each other. The serotype, the names, right, Newport or Interiridus, do correspond to uh, the sequence-based uh, phylogenetic analysis. But there are some exceptions where if when you see the colors uh, mixing in, that means there's two serotypes that are in the same cluster. Or when you see uh, same colors in different clusters, that means the, the same serotype is subdivided into several distinct clusters. And that, uh, in some cases, means that the, the name and the phylogenetic analysis, are in, the serotype and the phylogenetic analysis are inconsistent. And what uh, we were able to systematically show is that, indeed, most of the 
uh, so so on the right here, the uh, x-axis shows the number, uh, a threshold. So what's the, the cutoff that we use to cluster these genomes? And on the y-axis, the number of um, uh, uh, number of, of uh, clusters that zero bars, I should say, that are either um, that either have their uh, that either either fall into one uh, cluster or to multiple clusters. So not monophyletic versus non monophyletic. And as you can see, uh, when you have a very stringent cutoff, right? So the organisms are more similar to each other. The zero uh, zero bar information is concordant with the um, biologic information in the, uh, but as you increase the cutoff used, then you see more and more um, uh, zero groups fall into the same cluster as you, as you would expect. And then, as I mentioned, some of these then correspond to uh, cases where you have uh, um, polyphyletic structure for the zero bars. Now we end with a bit of the, the uh, COVID-related uh, uh, topics, of course. Uh, COVID is, is uh, near and dear to, to all our hearts uh, after it significantly affect our life for the last three years. Um, but genomics really have been the hero of COVID-19 pandemics because this is actually the first time we were able to deploy genomic epidemiology in almost real time to study an infectious disease outbreak. So the sequencing of SARS-CoV genomes can uh, tell us uh, how the uh, viruses uh, spread regionally, provincially, nationally, in, and internationally. In other words, we can track transmissions of the viruses. We also can use it for outbreak investigation, as I mentioned uh, previously, for uh, by looking at the clustering patterns and by uh, looking at comparing the, the phylogenetic results with the epidemiological evidence. Uh, and however, uh, the other advantage of having the sequences is that as the viruses evolve, uh, your detection methods such as PCR can fail, right? So you, many of you might have heard of primer um, dropout where the old, the primer that would, PCR primer that would design uh, based on the uh, sequences no longer work on the mutated sequence because uh, it doesn't anneal as, as well. And therefore regions of the genomes would not be amplified if there's, if the primer regions contain uh, mutations. Um, it could also um, allow us to reliably characterize the different variants and uh, systematically look at how the mutations evolve over time. And there are many, many studies looking at these type of, of mutation to, to functional variations. Um, and the studies, of course, informs uh, effective measures in uh, healthcare and in public health. So many, there are many national and international efforts at the early stage of the pandemic and all throughout the pandemic to try to uh, implement genomic epidemiology uh, to um, uh, study this outbreak and to, uh, in response to this outbreak, I should say. In Canada, this is uh, highlighted by the Canadian COVID-19 Genomics Network. And it was established in tw um, March 2020 at the early stage of the pandemic with an initial investment of uh, $40 million from the federal government. And $20 million went into viral genomic sequencing and $20 million went into human host genome sequencing of the infected individuals. So this is a large consortium driven approach with uh, partners from national, uh, provincial, and uh, uh, well, public health laboratories, hospital laboratories, and other research institutions. And there's also large scale uh, genomic sequencing centers involved, uh, industry partners and other um, academic uh, labs and, and, um, and uh, researchers from, from different institutions. 
So the goal was to coordinate uh, SARS-CoV-2 and host uh, genomic sequencing efforts. Our initial goal was actually just to sequence 150,000 viral genomes and 10,000 human genomes. And as you'll see later, we, at least for the viral genome, went way over that. Um, and the uh, integration of sequence data need to then be coupled with the uh, contextual information. And as, because there's large number of groups involved, that requires to harmonize the data uh, collected across various uh, agencies. So that was the effort that Emma will describe more uh, later. And it, it also the key here is to work together. So it, uh, there's a heavy emphasis on facilitating data sharing nationally and internationally. And most important is to, as I mentioned, not to have all these efforts went to work waste and have a uh, capacity that built in at the right places uh, to prevent future um, pandemics uh, or future, uh, we cannot prevent pandemics, but at least, uh, we cannot prevent outbreaks, of, but hopefully at least prevent future pandemics from happening and do better pandemic preparedness. Okay, so this is just to show that uh, uh, this is a, a global, uh, sorry, a national effort, Ken Gen, and to date, actually more than half a million viral genomes were sequenced in Canada with both Cancogen funding and actually a lot of provincial and federal additional investment in uh, generating the data. And all the data, of course, uh, need to go somewhere to be utilized. So there was a virus seek data portal set up uh, led by McGill uh, and Ontario Institute of Cancer Research to provide the genomic information and the associated metadata uh, to researchers, and these are uh, publicly available resources. Okay, now, so um, genomic epidemiology, you'll hear about this term, you know, many, many times throughout this workshop, and you'll get further sort of refined definition for uh, for this term, but, um, but for now, well, I'll just give a very high level definition, and I would characterize it as a a com uh, combination of whole genome sequencing data from pathogens with epidemiological investigations to track the spread of an infectious disease. So the epidemiological information provides the contextual evidence for uh, this genomic data, and the genomic data provide the diagnostic information uh, to support the epidemiological evidence. And this is a very different from a traditional clinical microbiology laboratory approach where different tests were used for different organisms and they have different um, turnaround time, they have different equipment needs, they have different personnel needs to, uh, for example, reading a confocal or reading a microscope, not, not a confocal, just reading a microscope is quite, uh, to, to characterize the morphology of a pathogen is quite uh, an ex uh, you need quite a bit of expertise to do that, and it's not something you will just be able to do with a few days of, of training. So, um, so we want to uh, replace a large number of, uh, well, at least complement a large number of laboratory testing uh, with a more uh, consolidated approach using whole genome sequence-based uh, workflow. So the workflow is in a very high level, simple view, essentially involves collecting of DNA samples and uh, sequencing the set samples and to generate the sequences that then uh, process using bioinformatic tools, which then lead to diagnostic re uh, report, prevent preventive measures or uh, even new drugs being developed. This then of course uh, provides interventions to uh, um, particular disease or, or outbreak. The benefit of the, the uh, approach is that it really simplifies the workflow need and it has much faster turnaround time than some applications. Um, it's also cost saving by reducing the number of platforms and instrument need. And uh, sequencing has become such a commodity that um, a lot of the uh, know-how is available in the community. And the results of uh, 
in other words, the sequences are also more uh, comparable and shareable than other test uh, result types. So then the, um, the the sequence data can also be used for value added analysis, such as uh, pathogen um, evolution analysis, as I shown before, AMR predictions, as I've shown before, and transmission and dynamic modeling, which you will see uh, more um, in the uh, subsequent sections. It does have some challenges, though, this approach, that it results in, uh, the results are harder to process and to interpret it because the volume of the data involved. Um, and this is, I guess, why we're all here to learn about the, the process. But also, it, it requires more computational resources to uh, support these type of uh, data processing and analysis and to, um, uh, to uh, do this if you don't have the adequate infrastructure uh, could be quite uh, challenging. It also is a rapidly changing technology. Uh, the technologies involved are rapidly changing. So it's it, uh, keeping up with the, the technology um, on itself it requires a lot of R&D uh, work in itself requires a lot of R&D work. And this is why collaboration between practitioners and research can really benefit the process. So the per sample cost is still higher than some of the traditional tests, but this could be, is being reduced further uh, as we start batching large number of samples and start uh, streamlining some of the operations. So briefly about high throughput sequencing. So next gen sequencing and third generation sequencing and collectively calling high throughput sequencing. And um, sequence data have many um, uh, clinical and public health laboratory utilities. I listed some of them here that you will uh, uh, actually learn more about uh, throughout the, the workshop. Uh, the, Data, as I mentioned, can also be used for uh, uh, understanding pathogen evolution and uh, understanding uh, the characteristics of these pathogens, which you cannot do if you're just looking at the marker gene, for example. So there are several sequencing platforms uh, on the market. The most popular ones, I would say, are the bottom three for now. The Illumina uh, sequencers, the nanopore sequencers are probably by far the, the dominant technologies. But PacBio and IonTorrent, or called Gene Studios, are still uh, used by uh, places, especially Gene Studios seem to find its way into diagnostic uh, facilities given the, the streamlined workflow used. The cost of, for sequencing have decreased uh, drastically over the, the years. And uh, this uh, fairly recent study actually highlights some of the uh, um, characteristics associated with each of the platforms. And the for example, the cost per uh, million uh, reads or the cost per, per million, uh, in this case, billion basis. And so on. Um, they also highlight the runtime needed and the uh, the throughput and so on. So it's a useful reference uh, to have. It uh, last I want to highlight. It also mentioned the uh, read accuracies and the uh, the read. Um, actually, I don't think it's shown here, but the uh, yeah the read lens and the read accuracy of the. Um, as shown in the last, the, 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 these two columns here, um, the we, uh, of, of the different instruments. So just wanna briefly mention the short versus long read sequencing. And you, again, you'll see some of these uh, mentioned in subsequent lectures. So short reads uh, as exemplified by Illumina sequencing are much uh, cheaper per base uh, but the read lens is only a, a few hundred base pairs, typically in the low hundreds, so one to 300 base pairs. Uh, they're higher capacity throughput uh, instruments uh, in, the, in the Illumina family of sequencers. They're also much more accurate than the long read sequencing. 
Um, so the per base error rate is less than is less than 0.1%. Uh, however, the reads are um, consensus reads, so they're of many molecules rather than a single molecule. The long read technologies, on the other hand, are more expensive per base, and they're lower capacity through uh, throughput machines, and also. Uh, because they're typically reading from a single molecule, uh, their accuracy is low, also lower um, than short reads. But the typical read lens is at least a few thousand base pairs to tens of um, hundreds of thousand base pairs. And there's actually competition to see who can get the longest read possible out of a min ion uh, sequencer. Um, but uh, because of the, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, uh, shortly, but we first want to characterize the pathogen genomes. So bacterial genomes typically contain a single circular chromosome. Um, some are linear, but mostly circular chromosome, but also only a single copy. So they're haploid genomes. They may contain extra chromosomal DNAs called plasmids. And, um, and the genome size typically range from half a megabase to uh, roughly 10 megabases. Uh, there's some large ones being discovered uh, more recently. But the, when we talked about pathogens, the average is actually about three to 500 megabases and roughly correspond to 3,000 to 5,000 genes. Uh, viruses are much more diverse. They can be DNA or RNA. They could be single-stranded, double-stranded, and they're classified into seven uh, high-level families. Uh, they're size range from one to two KBs to one to two megabases. Um, again, some large viruses have been discovered um, and they depend on um, host uh, cellular mechanisms to replicate. So that's why their uh, genomes are much smaller. Uh, there are also eukaryotic parasites such as fungal prot uh, protist and, and worms. There are usually a few um, uh, 100 megabases or a few, uh, I was I said missing word there, but basically a few hundred megabases in genome size. And they're usually in multiple chromosomes. Um, and these genomes are constantly evolved through uh, different uh, evolutionary forces. So the genomes can, uh, Undergone, uh, undergo deletions, re, uh, reducing the genomes, uh, it's often increased the fitness if, if the organism is in a specialized niche, for example, only infect a certain type of host uh, or, or become an uh, endogenic pathogen for, or for certain um, uh, hosts. The genomes are also uh, undergo rearrangements, and this could, of course, affect uh, um, the expression of genes when you have, when the genomes are arranged. But, uh, and same thing with gene duplications, the uh, genes could duplicate and could lead to selective loss of a copy of the genes. Uh, but new functions can also evolve when, when you have gene duplications. But very different from the predominant mode of eukaryotic transmission, which is typically sexually reproduction or within the species, bacteria through horizontal gene transfer uh, could actually acquire genes from a wide range of, of uh, non-parental organisms and in other species or other strains of, um, and therefore its ability to rapidly uh, changes genome composition um, is quite remarkable. So briefly, I would just want to mention uh, a few terms, and I think Fiona would, would go over this a bit more as well. So homology means similarity due to shared common ancestry. So it's a yes or no characteristics, right? We don't talk about degree of homology. We talk about degrees of similarity. So you either are you either belong you either share the same ancestor or you do not. So uh, just keep in mind when you think about homology, it's yes or no, not degrees of differences. And within the homologous uh, genes, in other words, genes that have the same ancestry, you have orthologs that arise due to speciation, and paralogs that arise due to gene duplication. 
and xenon logs that arise due to horizontal uh, gene transfer. So there is no homology um, because they don't share the same ancestor. Okay, so now the um, process involved in whole genome uh, shotgun sequence analysis uh, are as follows. So you first have uh, your DNA isolated uh, and then uh, sequenced and uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the DNA, um, if it's from a, um, isolates, you first would, would culture it, and then you will uh, shear the DNA, extract the DNA, shear the DNA. Um, you might end up only selecting certain targeted region through PCR amplification for, for uh, sequencing, and then you put it on a sequencer followed by uh, analysis. For uh, um, microbiome type of studies, you of course, bypass the cultural step and you go straight to um, go straight to uh, amplification followed by sequencing. Okay, so uh, the sequence data analysis essentially involves trying to piece together millions or billions of overlapping reads and uh, and, uh, and uh, assemble them, we're, we're putting them together for uh, subsequent analysis. Uh, or alternatively, you would process them as reads and then use them for analysis, but that, again, will be discussed later. So as I mentioned, there's the, the steps are assemble your uh, reads into contates or in, back into uh, uh, the genome, and then annotate the uh, the sequences to have functional information and uh, location of the genes determined, and then you would then carry out variant analysis, and that should say module uh, five rather than module three. Okay, now the uh, the genome assembly process. There's two different flavors. One is the novel assembly, where you a computer algorithm essentially try to identify overlapping sequence and merge them together. There's also reference assist assembly. Uh, sometimes people refer to them as mapping that will map your sequences to existing uh, related genome sequences. So the assembly qualities, assembly qualities and therefore affected by the reference genome use. If your reference genome is very different from your own genome, then the assembly quality will be lower because the mapping process will not be as accurate. And there are actually dedicated lecture for this that you can look up if you're interested in. So the main point that I would like to mention out of this discussion is to say why the long reads are beneficial. So why do we in microbial genomics sequencing often prefer to have longer reads rather than shorter reads. And that's because in the genomes, there are often repeat elements. In, and if you have short reads, then that does not span the entire repeat as shown in the uh, blue. Uh, so each you can think of each of this as a repeat sequence. And if you think the darker blue is the short reads, then you could see that they don't span the entire repeats. And as a sort of result of that, they don't resolve the repeat properly and often can lead to misassemblies. So for example, only um, re recognizing two distinct repeats uh, as opposed to uh, six up here. On the other hand, if you have long reads as uh, depicted in these long blue reads, then your long reads can uh, be longer than the, the repeat uh, sequences. I'm hoping you can see my mouse cursor. Um, and as a result, the long reads, because it uh, spans the whole repeats, will have less trouble uh, putting, uh, recognizing that there's this long repeat in the genome and therefore uh, assemble the, the genome correctly. So uh, the novel assembly of short read sequences that contain uh, 
uh, often have trouble spanning the repetitive regions. Um, that is the message that I want to highlight here. Uh, as I mentioned, the different sequencers have different error rate. Without going into the details, just want to say that the third generation, such as MinI and Wapak Bio, usually have a much higher error rate, and that requires extensive error correction or uh, consensus-based uh, error correction. Uh, the uh, next-gen sequencers, such as Illumina, on the other hand, have much lower error rate. And this um, ability for long reads to close the gaps uh, in the genome or to span regions that otherwise the short read cannot um, successfully span uh, usually results in more, com more complete genomes uh, with fewer gaps in them. Uh, so contact just means contiguous sequences and um, your complete genomes ideally would be a single contact that span the entire chromosome of the genome and a number of extra chromosomal elements such as uh, plasmids in its own uh, separate contacts, but often we don't uh, see that. Okay, so the annotation process uh, is the process of assigning functions and gene locations to the sequences. And again, we won't be covering this in the uh, lecture, in the workshop this, this time, but uh, it's just for you to familiar with some of these terminologies. Okay, so I'll skip over this actually for now. Um, and just so to highlight there are automated systems. And because this is process that have been more or less automated, that's why you can just take the, the results from these automated annotation and carry on with your work. Um, and there are some caveats, but it's not something we will drill on too deeply in this uh, workshop. And for the sake of time, uh, I will uh, just say that a lot of the work that we're doing essentially fall under the umbrella of comparative genomics. Essentially, we're trying to identify variations in the genome and use those variations to um, uh, link to epidemiology, uh, epidemiological evidence. So the type of uh, variations could be regional, could be gene by gene, or could be single nucleotide. And you will see both the gene-by-gene gene method and the single nucleotide method being discussed uh, in the workshop. Okay, can skip that. Uh, and I want to introduce the idea of a pan-genome. So uh, comparative genomics resulted uh, in the pan-genome concept being proposed in 2005. And this was the realization that when you look at uh, uh, several strains of uh, a, within a single species of bacterium, uh, you can see that some of the genes are shared, and these are called the core genome, with a, and they're typically um, correspond to housekeeping genes that are uh, important for the survival of the organism. And you also will see uh, strain-specific accessory genes that correspond to lifestyle or adaptation type of genes. So the pen genome calculation essentially gives you a sense whether a particular species have an open or closed pen genome. A closed pen genome means that uh, there's a, a somewhat limited number of new genes that you expect to see when you sequence more of a given organism, given species, I should say. An open pen genome, such as E. coli, on the other hand, the more uh, strains you sequence, the more new genes you're going to discover. Um, okay. um, and uh, yes, so the last little bit is, is um, um, actually just touch base on, on what we will cover more in depth in, in uh, module three. So this to highlight one of the ongoing efforts called ERIDA, where, um, um, in, uh, integrated Rapid Infectious Disease Analysis Platform, or uh, that was developed by the National Microbiology Laboratory, 
uh, in Gary's group and, and this collaboration with Gary, Fiona, and actually uh, Andrew and, and almost everyone uh, that, that's in this. And this is actually when we how we first got together and eventually proposed the, the workshop. And it's, it's to build the, the tools, the, plat the software platforms needed for doing uh, um, genomic epidemiology analysis by uh, um, practitioners. So it has simple user interface, uh, so on and so forth. And as I mentioned, the, the partnership. Okay, I'll skip all these and just jump to the end. Because uh, some of these will be highlighted. So I would want to highlight one thing to end this lecture, which is there is um, a challenge in data sharing in Canada in that Canadian comprise of 14 distinct healthcare systems at the provincial level. And there's no universal standard for data collection um, or sharing. And also uh, there's no legal binding public health data sharing agreement in Canada. Um, and as a result of that, during the early days of the pandemic, uh, data sharing in Canada was quite delayed. And as you can see here, analysis done, done by Arpoon show that the, uh, the delay, delay between sample collection and submission to public repository was quite delayed in Canada. And also the type of metadata or the contextual information available for these records is also quite limited. And that prompt uh, some of the efforts um, uh, by us and others to, to try to correct course. Um, and by and large, we were quite successful in that. So some of the reasons that were cited for the delay include capacity to process sequence data and metadata for public health um, um, laboratory, uh, within the public health laboratories to be able to release such data. And uh, there's also uh, multiple sign off needed to release. And of course, there's very legitimate privacy concerns and that's why these protocols were put in place. Uh, and uh, the uh, desire to have only release high quality data was another reason that was delayed. So um, as mentioned, a few uh, studies led by uh, Yang Jolie's group and, and my group really tried to take a, a social science angle to understand the problem. So one was focusing more on privacy concerns and the second focusing more on Canadians opinion on this, on, on data sharing. And just going to the punchline to say that most Canadians are actually uh, in favor of sharing the identified uh, records and the uh, identified sequence records and um, related contextual information such as uh, symptom, uh, vaccine status of the uh, case, age, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the, the uh, onus then now is on uh, public health and on, on lawmakers to try to reflect the willingness to share data, but also to do data sharing uh, responsibly. So the idea is that uh, data not being collected may result in a subset of data that can be shared. This is what we call the minimum contextual data, but still a large number of uh, other data types could be collected in response to healthcare needs or, or research needs and so on. And then mechanisms for more responsive data sharing uh, will need to be put in place to allow us to benefit from all the resources to pull into, put into data collection. Okay, with that, I will thank you for your attention and uh, end my uh, lecture.